can you imagine a world where we have no electricity? Electricity is dangerous. If you put your finger in a plug socket, it will probably give you a good shock or not kill you. And a world where there is no alcohol, no drugs, no pharmaceuticals. You know, actually, all of these products could kill us in significant levels. So there is a bit of an issue that we have with plant breeding. There has been a long-standing issue with GMOs and therefore plant breeding, and it is therefore seen as a bit of a Frankenstein situation. Actually, plant breeding is an age-old tradition and has been going on for our, with our forefathers for a very long time. So in comes me with, my, uh, with very significant thanks to my sponsors. Uh, in comes little old me to help, um, you know, help really push out breeding into the, into the UK ar arable sector. I'm really proud of this picture on the right here. This is me at Simmet's headquarters in Mexico. Um, and it stood by the statue of Norman Borlaug, who is the founder of the Green Revolution in 1960. And I tweeted this picture, and his granddaughter actually retweeted it back to say how proud she was that he is still uh, bringing imaginations to, uh, to the younger generation. So I started off with my, uh, with my Nuffield topic. And for me, I had a really good understanding of the UK arable sector and breeding and, um, and therefore um, the, the market. But I didn't have a good enough understanding of actually what plant breeding was. And so I really set about to have a look at what traditional plant breeding was um, and having a look at radiation as well. So in my report, I set out, I really break down a lot of the, the principles, the founding principles of what we call traditional plant breeding. In there, we've got hybrids, looking at what hybrids are, uh, how we produce hybrids. And obviously, we have hybrid wheat coming to the market in the UK at the end of this, uh, end of this century. And that's going um, to be great. But a lot of the issue with these, uh, these what we call traditional uh, plant breeding methods is that they actually take a very long time. Um, and they can be very laborious. They take a lot of um, people skills. Um, and for 100 varieties uh, that have gone through uh, plant breeding, you will only get one commercial variety. And that takes a lot of effort. So we know around the world, obviously, Nuffield is all about traveling. So for me, I really wanted to also look into what was GMO and gene editing. Um, and just, just to simply break this down right now, GMOs are, um, as you can see there on the left-hand side, it's a whole gene uh, from a foreign organism inserted into a DNA complex. And on the right-hand side, it is different. Gene editing allows the insertion, deletion, or switching of a small part of the genome um, into, uh, into a DNA helix. The most, um, the most common way of doing this is using CRISPR, which is a bacterial um, enzyme, and it is a very technical um, and um, specific way of, of targeting the gene. But the EU, and therefore the UK pre-Brexit, has taken a very conservative stance on, this, um, on these two um, breeding methods um, in agriculture as a whole. So during my four-year tenure, yes, I was a 20, 20 scholar, so it's four years, I, you know, my world changed. You know, COVID changed us, and also um, the UK changed in terms of breeding. So in comes the UK Breeding Bill, which was um, approved by Royal Assent in March this year. Um, and actually, it brings a lot of opportunity to us in UK agriculture. So um, it really is going to be able to bring a lot of faster, um, faster solutions to UK market. We hope that these are going to be more sustainable as well. And hopefully we're going to be able to create more plant varieties that are more adaptable to our ever-changing climate. And that is, you know, it's a very real issue. We have significant weather patterns going on right now with UK uh, winter wheat crops. So just three examples there of something we might be able to see with gene editing technology. So uh, celiac safe wheat, so removing the, um, the germ that's actually got celiac in it. 
longer strawberry seasons with longer flowering periods so that then uh, you get more production for in the UK. Um, and climate resilient lettuce that can be grown all year round. So actually we'll be bringing more UK uh, production to the UK. But on the right hand side here, I have quite a few, um, quite a few topics that I cover in, um, in my um, report that, that talks about the, the problems that we have. So at the moment, this is only approved in England. We have a divulged parliament. And so this is not approved in Scotland, Wales and Ireland. And so actually, it's a very limited England market. Animal, um, animal welfare was of concern, so animals are not included at the moment in the bill. Um, and there is a lot of work going on at the moment about the regulatory uh, piece of how products are brought to market and how they're labelled. So, and, and obviously, there's a lot of work to do about educating the public and, and the brilliant ability that it has. Only today... Uh, the UK medical authorities actually approved a new drug that was done by gene editing for sickle cell anemia. So actually, it's never been, this is, a, you know, this is a, an issue that a lot of the public have, and um, they're bringing a new drug with, um, with gene editing. So one of the things that I really found out during my, during my travels was actually that um, gene editing in the UK is, um, is actually going to foster a lot of startup companies, and this will bring more diversity into the UK market. So at the moment, we in Europe have always seen a market that's driven by big multinational companies. You know, there's sort of five monopoly breeders that operate in the European market, and generally they breed for a northwest, um, northwest um, situation. Well, actually, with gene editing, that's going to open up a lot of opportunities. There's a lot of startups coming. We're going to see a lot of little companies doing really great things. Um, and actually, a lot, of, um, a lot of companies and pharmaceuticals are looking at agriculture as a great opportunity to invest in and diversify. So as you can see here, there's, um, there is uh, these little plants that I looked at at John Innes Center. They are in test tubes and they are a single wheat plant. But realistically, we are five years away from seeing these plants in uh, an agricultural trial situation. And we are therefore 10 years away from seeing these on supermarket shelves, which is a long way away from where the government are thinking that this is going to hit and uh, hit our supermarket shelves in two years. I also looked at farm inputs. So... I break this down into the three uh, traditional categories of, um, of chemistry. And I really looked at sort of um, what else is happening in the world. So I had a look at USA. I mean, everybody knows about GMOs and Roundup, uh, Roundup and glyphosate. So Roundup Ready soybeans, when they were brought into America, were a revolutionary thing. And they were brought in in the 1990s. Um, and farmers really did, really did support it. In the first year of sales, it led to a 36% reduction in herbicides. But unfortunately, farmers really enjoyed looking at some nice, uh, very clean fields. And so low and repeated dose broke the chemistry. And we now have what we call super weeds, which are Roundup resistant or glyphosate resistant. And in insecticides, I, um, I interviewed quite a few people in India and researchers about Bt resistant corn. This is a devastating uh, pest to um, a lot of the poorer community in the world. Um, and with this technology, it really enables them to be able to produce food for their community. And again, in fungicides, I was really interested. I, in Mexico, I, I got to see uh, UG99, which is a prolific rust. It's called a, it's a stripe rust, and it devastates fields in Africa. So I spent some time uh, talking to people in Kenya, working out what are the really big issues with this, um, with this issue. But effectively, there is no significant breeding change uh, to this pathogen. Um, gene editing has not been uh, developed for stripe rust resistance. Uh, so it's only using technical, uh, technical techniques. And so we really care about the environment. My whole, my whole topic is to really ask farmers, you know, where do you spend your money on farm? And could you look at, could you look at spending more money in your genetics and putting, 
putting some more money that way. Only because, you know, these people that, that go into genetics put a lot of time and effort into breeding these varieties and are doing great things. So at the top here, you can see some vertical columns. These were in Denmark. And you can see vertical columns. Wheat plants are, um, are planted in the top. And each of the slats uh, show where the, rooting, uh, where the rooting chambers, where the roots come down to. So they can have a look at which, uh, which varieties have, have the greatest rooting capacity. In the middle there, that was in Mexico. They used, um, they used heat, uh, heat pads at the top there. And you can see there's quite a big difference to how the, um, the plots of varieties have, have reacted to the heat. Um, and therefore, that is, that is looking at um, drought tolerance and also heat stress, which we know is going to be a climatic issue. And then at the bottom there, um, that is in France, and you can see that um, they are looking at, they're putting um, nutrients down the poles, and they are looking at how the varieties react to the different levels of nutrients that, um, that are put down there. So with the EU, um, with the EU um, European Green Deal coming in, they are asking farmers to do a 50% reduction by 2030, and that is a big ask. But we're already seeing a lot of farmers shift towards this, and they are being incentivized to reduce their fungicides and insecticide use. And in the UK, we are also seeing farmers that are looking at regenerative agriculture. They're looking at mixing of varieties to reduce that risk um, and an increase in biologicals. So... In summary, we know that traditional plant breeding takes many years of success. But with the UK breeding bill and gene editing, we have so much opportunity to shorten these cycles and bring varieties to market within five years from start to finish. We also know that it's going to bring both genetic and business diversity. So we're not going to have a monopolistic um, environment that we currently have with plant breeders. And that brings so much opportunity and it also has so much opportunity to help with a healthier environment, a reduction in chemistry and also uh, a better use of uh, sustainability. So it wouldn't be enough for a presentation if I didn't say a, a massive thank you to my sponsors. You can see here I am very lucky to be sponsored by Savills, the Worshipful Company of Farmers and the Central Region Farmers Trust. And without which and Nuffield scholarships, I would not have been able to do my travelling and be able to do my research. So thank you very much.